I'm going to start by introducing our interlocutor, um, but I actually I'm going to introduce two people. So the first is our interlocutor for this discussion and for, um, for the first three panelists. His name is David J. Lewis. David is a committed colleague, a gifted teacher, with a deep knowledge of history and of the practice of, ar of architecture. He's an accomplished, award-winning architect and founding principal with Paul Lewis and Mark Tsuramaki of LTL Architects, a design-intensive architecture firm who realize inventive solutions that turn the very constraints of every project into the design trajectory, exploring opportunistic overlaps between space, program, form, budget, and materials. They are currently working on their fourth book to be published next spring by Princeton Architectural Press called Manual of Section. David is an associate professor here at Parsons, an adjunct professor of architecture at the University of Limerick in Ireland, and sits on the advisory council of the College of Architecture, Art and Planning at Cornell University. We are very grateful that he agreed to participate, help us with aftertaste, and participate as an interlocutor today. Thank you so much. And he was going to introduce the speakers, but I'm butting in here. <laughs> because the first speaker is Kina Lesky, who was my teacher with a capital T. And I actually believe there are very few teachers we have in life that are as such. She is a mentor. Kina taught me to walk in the dark for much longer than feels comfortable and to pr probe in the dark for information. And this is not a metaphor. <laughs> she taught me to believe that there are, there are answers to questions even if you can't see them even if you doubt that they're there. And that sometimes the answer arrives without effort. You just have to be receptive. She taught me to look inward. She taught that to make something authentic takes that ability to look inward. She taught that precision is absolutely essential. And she taught me to change the X-Acto blade after every cut. <laughs> Kina Lesky has invested her life in navigating the creative process. She is principal at 360 Architecture, a professor of architecture at Rhode Island School of Design, an aspiring and practicing actor, an award-winning rower, and she is currently working on a book on the creative process with MIT Press, which will be published this fall. Manuscript turned in a few days ago. Congratulations. Kina earned her Bachelor's of Architecture from Cooper Union down the street and her master's degree from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. Please help me welcome Kina Lesky. Well, I feel as though I just had a full meal and I need to digest. And actually, we're going to start. Um, with a quote by Lewis Carroll, and I also found out this morning that this whole conference will end by a quote from Lewis Carroll. And he said, uh, he compared that period of daydreaming, of ideas incubating, that valuable time of taking a pause to masticating and chewing your food. And he felt that there was a great danger to be reading and taking in too much information without doing that. So I'm going to now start the process of indigestion in this room since we've just had a very full meal. I th thank you for it, John Sara and the poet and also Catherine. So I'm doing something that uh, last night we saw improvisation and improvisation to me is a word for something that I think we all do. We just do it in different durations. Even if you have a script, you have to make a journey through a script as an actor. You have to discover each line. You have to see what's at stake. And so there is a form of improvisation that happens even when something is scripted. Um, and in design, I mean, I think there is improvisation in design as well. There are parameters and things you have to work with. There is a deadline, but there is a creative process of discovery that takes place very much like what we saw last night. It just is something that has a duration that is over a greater extent. And 
I'm one of the, for me, one of the most valuable ways of learning about the creative process, learning about how people navigate, is to see a manuscript or to see process photos or to see the erasures and, and things being crossed out. So I'm going to be showing you in the first half of my presentation a project that took seven years that in my mind is very much an improvisation. It's a project I did while practicing architecture, while teaching, while doing other things. But this one unfolded completely organically. There was no deadline. There was no client. There were no expectations. There wasn't even an audience. It was something that I just followed as it came up. I, I as sort of tracked and, and found things along a seven-year process. And so I'm going to show it to you very quickly. And I'm going to try to identify in a very short sentence or two what it was that made me, propelled me to the next step with whatever comes to mind along the way. And then the second half, I'll read a little story which is based on that project that was done after the fact, which brings me to this quote um, by, by Lewis Carroll and focusing on what the Queen says at the end, it is a poor sort of memory that works, that only works backwards. So I thought about that and I thought, well, Actually, I found this quote not by reading through the looking glass, but reading Jung's writings, because he liked this quote a lot. And so I thought, what is the memory that works only backwards? Or what, what sort of memory can not just work only backwards? And I thought, oh, that's the imagination. That's the ability to see something, to see into the future, to see something that doesn't exist yet. And um, there's this quote by the composer Mazorsky, which I hope I don't destroy it which was that the artist feels comfortable in the, in the future, with the future, because he lives in it. So it, it, it's not only imagination, as we've heard from examples already, is not just fantasy. It is a psychic commitment to something that doesn't yet exist. And that projection of a project of, you know, with, with the empty table, the empty page, of committing to something that doesn't yet exist. And there's ways in which I think one can do that more vividly, with more of a commitment, with, as um, John Lewis said, believing that it already has happened, as John Sara said earlier. So to start now into my seven-year project, I have to set the timer because I want to make sure I don't mess up with time. Sorry. I guess I need a clock somewhere. OK. Oops. OK, I got it. All right. So this project started with a gift. Someone gave me a Super 8 camera. Can we turn off the lights by any chance so that th this is not so bright? These are images of a still, a still images of film that I took with the Super 8 camera, which was a gift. Which, and I think gifts are incredibly powerful um, catalysts for a process that hasn't started or one that's on its way. There, it, first of all, I mean, uh, Suzuki, the Zen teacher, talked about non-attachment as, as being the foundation of a beginner's mind. And a beginner's mind, that state of a beginner's mind is something that an expert can have or a beginner can have. And it's something that I, I would say that is what improvisation is, is trying to maintain the beginner's mind always. And it's something that is necessary, even if you are a scientist, to have those moments of, and there's so many examples in science. when. You know, someone discovers something while eating meal away from the laboratory. But anyway, the, the idea of non-attachment is about giving. It's about no longer feeling that something belongs to you. It's also about receiving and feeling that you can, you can adopt something, you know, freely. There, the, the boundary of where you are, what you are, what your project is, is no longer a brick wall. And so that idea of a, a non-attachment, the gift as an instigator, is very important. So this, that's a long story for this slide. but. It was a gift of a Super 8 camera. I started filming these polar bears in the zoo. And I was really fascinated by how they seemed like the fish that was asked what the sea is like, they, in, that the poet talked about. They were so fused in their environment, with their environment, with each other. And you could see this in the close-ups as the fur moved. It both embodied the movement of one bear, but also the other and the movement of the water. And it made me think of this poem by Rainer Maria Rilke, uh, the Eighth Elegy, if I can remember parts of it, um, 
Never enough for a single day do we have before us that pure space the flowers continually open into. For us, it's always a world and never a nowhere without the no, a pure, unguarded space you can breathe and fully realize and not be longing after, the way an animal will lose itself in the silence sometimes and have to be shaken from it, or another dies and is it. So we see that in animals. We see that ability to be in the nowhere without the no, a pure, unguarded space you can breathe and fully realize. And I thought, what an architectural question. Where the self begins and the other, where the self ends and the other begins. Where is, I mean, what, what, what more, how, how else should one think about house or home? Where is that line? And that's what started from this gift onto propelling me further to think about where does the self begin and end, and where does the other begin and end? This is an x-ray of a snake in a jar that found its tail thinking it was something else, like a dog chasing its tail and ate it, until it continued around and passed through its esophagus. But don't wince, because we do the same thing. I, this is a little sketch of, of floaters. Those of you who are, have myopia and are nearsighted, when you look at the blank sky and you see these little things floating through, you chase them, don't you? You start following them when you're, when you're daydreaming. And then you find that they keep moving away because they're not on the outside of your eye in the, in the uh, tears. They're actually deep in the eye near the retina. And so they're inverted and that's why they move away when you look at them. So we think they're outside of us. We think they're on the surface of their eyes, but they're part of us. And that's, you could say, for a lot of things. Where do we begin and end? Is it, is it the skin encapsulated body? Is it our love? Is it our work? Is it our, our family? How, where, where do we extend? I, I know a, um, extend too. I have a friend, Frank Wilson, who's a neurologist, who believes that this pushes around. He's an, his, he wrote a great book, The Hand. Everyone should read it. He believes this pushes around the brain more than the brain pushing around this, and he can make an evolutionary argument for it. And he was a clinical neurologist. But he also believes that the, what the arcs you make in space is also part of your mind. And that's a neurologist. So anyway, where do you begin and end? An architect should, begin, should think about that thing. And that led me to geometry because, like everything leads me to architecture, everything leads me to geometry as well. There's this great fo form called a conchoid, which I can't, don't have time to go into, but it basically is an infinite, a form that goes from a sphere, which you see there, to this, these infinite forms. So I cast them out of, out of um, plaster. I turn them. This is one end of the form. It's a surface on the top and the bottom. It has a cusp on the bottom. And then as this form, it's, it has, I, I can't go into the geometry, but it basically starts to pinch itself off to become this finite thing. So it goes from an infinite to the finite, something that's very understandable, a sphere from the outside. You can see its limits, right? Very clear limits of the sphere. And that to me was interesting in, in speaking about this, these issues in terms of geometry. But that led me to think, oh, it's just geometry, it's noumenal, it's in the brain, I want to feel it, I want to sense it. So let's go to phenomena. So I took those plates and I cast them and I turned them into lenses. So you start seeing these conchoidal lenses to let light pass through. And then, of course, when you get to the sphere, you have a plano convex lens that produces images, which is amazing because it's taking something from one side and projecting it on the other. And it makes you think again about that boundary of yourself as the eye, as how the outside's coming in. We know the light gets in and it makes a little image on the back of your retina. But what happens with the rest of it? What happens with the particles? What happens with the energy as it continues through? Does it start to impact your dreams and your thinking and, and that you're unconscious? And are there things that emerge later that you've put into it that speak for you? You'll, I'll get to that later. Anyway, I also think that um, at somewhere I'm always thinking about this, which is my father an was an architect, and I grew up in a glass house. And so I didn't intend this to be autobiographical, but obviously it is. If you live in a glass house, you're very aware of being seen from the outside, and you're aware of when you're not seen. If you walk around the visual shadows of the house as a little girl, walking past the furniture so you, can't, you're, you can be invisible. So you're very aware of where the boundary really exists. Is the boundary of the house the plane of the glass? Is it into the woods? Is it back here where I am if I hide? 
So that's important for everyone, I think, in navigating their creative process. Your own personal narrative that you're constantly remaking, rewriting, influences what you find, what you see, what you know. So I started to study blind spots now. And uh, blind spot meaning what's, if, how do you, what's the geometry of a blind spot? What's the geometry, how do you make something invisible? So this is a, a study, I made this, this, this is actually John Sara helped me with this project. This, this hemisphere is, became the blind spot and I just investigated it with these concentric spheres of areas that would be uh, shaded so that light could not reach that uh, center hemisphere. And it's, it's based upon, this is an obvious and simple solution with one uh, a set of concentric cones reaching up the center axis vertically and, and shading areas without any redundancy. And I'm, I, I didn't show the bottom area shaded so you could see how this works, but you can imagine these rings that, that have tangents to that center hemisphere of the blind spot. But you can make it a little more complicated that maybe suits uh, the idea of moving around something, which is what this one is. If you had viewpoints, infinite viewpoints around that blind spot in all directions and then started to use the conic geometry as well to shade areas without redundancy, that's what this one is. I'm going too fast, I know. And this was, this was an idea about, well, you know, I'm an architect, it's gotta hit the ground and carry its load, so try to come up with a geometry that would do the same thing of obscuring the blind spot, but they could be self-supporting. And so the geometry is a little corrupted, I don't have time to go to all, all of that, but I basically pursued this one, and uh, we made this model demonstrating the geometry, and then built it to, uh, this is the geometry, built it out of a material that actually functioned to put it into a dark room to, to really see if it works. So this is that center hemisphere, the, the uh, blind spot, the successive screens, and then that object was placed on photographic paper in the, in the dark room, exposed to light, and it produced the photogram on the left, which when printed, you know, demonstrates that the light doesn't reach that center. From there, I thought, I, well, I moved to Rome, basically. And, um, <laughs> and I was thinking that, I, that who wants to live in a sphere that's a blind spot? And I thought, blind spots are found. You know, I found them. You find them all the time when you, when you find a place to sit in the room. Uh, you're aware of them. So I thought, well, let me just envision a, a forest of these sh shells that describe the, the view that you can't see always, you know, from your peripheral view back. And I made these little um, porcelain shells and I placed that on photographic paper and then exposed it to light. You see the center points to see, basically to discover the architecture, just discover the rooms, the extent to which the light could reach or your view could reach, you know, which you do when you walk through the woods. There's only so far you can see. It becomes a visual room. And then I took that same arrangement but exposed it to light from the periphery to see how far you could see in. And this then became, again, the desire to move into three dimensions. So I tried to envision completely, just intuitively, and this, I think, has something to do with imagination when you try to reach ahead of where you, what you know. You know, this was just trying to get an image of where this was going, trying to describe these, through these reliefs that I made, a spatial idea of those visual shadows. And then I made a discovery, um, which gets to something that I believe in, which is synchronicity or coincidence. I discovered that a cone intersecting a cone produces this petal shape. And if you have a cone of light introducing another cone of light or a cone in a cone, you get a petal shape, which connected many things. The thought of the, the, the flower that opens into the nowhere without the no. It connects the, the conic geometry I was using with the, with the blind spot studies. And it connected those petal shaped little things that I made intuitively about that shell around us. So I thought, all right, that's convincing. And so, oh, more to say about synchronicity later. But um, so that led to this, um, which was a sketch of what I envisioned the architecture could be. That there could be views 
infinite views that intersect that form the house. And so what you're seeing are these cones that project from eyes. And when they hit another cone, they make a wall that's a petal shaped. And when another cone hits that, it projects another, a vault from it to another cone where there's another petal shaped wall. So you can make the architecture out of views, basically. So I set out to do that. And I turned these cones and I started to use them as a kind of um, formwork for making the walls. By and the whole uh, house was designed without drawing on paper. It was designed by tracing on the cones, shining light and tracing the light. And so these are the products of the walls that, that were built for the model on that, those cones you just saw. A first petal that you see at the bottom was a cone of light intersecting a, a cone, and then a second source of light would make the second wall, and the third, the space in between would become rooms, the projections would become vaults. Any questions? Because I, <laughs> all right. And an example of you know, what the geometry is, how it could be made out of structurally, out of straight lines, and how, what a single room could be like. And then I said, OK, time to lay out the architecture. And I, the folded geometry of the day, sunrise to sunset, seemed relevant of ourselves. So it set up a, a geometry of spaces, a kitchen, a dining room, a space for, for people to come visit you, which I called floaters. The entry was blank. The bedroom was sleep, sleep, deep sleep dream room. The studio was fused with the all room. There was a sunrise room for breakfast, an insomnia room where the library was. And there was a space in the center where the blind spot was, where all these spaces accumulated, and it was out of sight where my lens would go and it would project an image from the outside into the center of the house. The stair became all those projections that piled up, sort of like a deck of cards. If you, if you fan a deck of cards, you can have many levels and many rooms on the outside, but if you at any point move to the center, you have a staircase. So in this house, if you move to the center, you're out of view, you're completely private. But at any point, you can move to the periphery and be in one of the spaces. And so this was my setup. I made a previous model, and then I began this one just by, as you can see, the shining a light and tr tracing it and building up layers of plywood, these very thin um, plywood. And this is the process of building the house in model. The model, final model, what you see there is a shadow of the wall that holds the lens. It's an actual lens that I got from Edmund Scientific with the correct uh, focal length, and it functions. It projects an image of the outside. And those, that's it assembled from above. And he, it, someone who may be here or may not be here, Kristen Jones, the artist, Kristen Jones, hi, asked me, I need to see drawings. <laughs> and I thought, but Kristen, I don't need drawings. So I thought, all right, we need to see drawings. So I started doing drawings, which are very difficult because um, these are the drawings that locate how the geometry of the house is located, the, the whole thing. And, and they are a composite made from, well, I'll show you later, these very difficult drawings of intersections of cones. Here's the other views of the model. This is the one, the only opening that is, all the openings are made based on these rays, except for this one on the south wall. Is that the south wall? Yes. That is a square where the, the light comes in that the lens receives. So these are the drawings that were necessary to, to re reproduce these, uh, locating the geometry of the intersecting cones in order to produce the drawings. Which you see here, the roof plan, like the, the top level, there's many levels, but top level as you move down through the house section. And at that time, because this was many years ago, the only way to get inside of this thing was using a surgical camera. Uh, so that's what this is. These are photos taken with a, a tube and a lens inside the house. And that's the lens wall. 
And that's an image that we're moving now up the stair around the lens wall, and you can see the projection of the house across the street from where I lived inside on what I call the retina wall. Now, while I was living in Rome, I had very vivid dreams, and I started to paint them. Again, a gift. Someone gave me a beautiful bound book of watercolor paper, and another person gave me a book of pigment, watercolor pigment. You cut the pages, and you mix water, and it becomes paint. It was fantastic. So one book filled, and the other book emptied. And I painted my dreams, and I learned a lot of things about the imagination through painting my dreams. One is that the imagination is real, as the, as, as the poet said, and as John Haydock used to say all the time. But I realized that in my dream, when I tried to then paint them, that what was under the table was as present or as real as what was on the table, if I was sitting at a table. But in our waking life, you can't see what's under the table. So if you were to draw what you see, you wouldn't include what's under the table. But in your dream, they have equal weight. And I was trying to just capture what I dreamt. So my drawings became like x-ray vision. And they also became time lapse, because there was, a, there was a compression of time that was very hard to describe in a line. So you'll see little elements of, of where the, you can see through my collar. You can see the sink. And they also were prophetic, a, a number in the sense that, not so much the story, but in the way that we take things in all the time that we're unaware of, that then become part of the sensory landscape. This happened all the time. I would walk into the spaces of my dreams days after I had them. And I can only attribute that to the fact that we're just not aware of how much we're, we're eating, you know, we're taking in. The time lapse of the arm. So the idea is that that house that you saw would be a canvas for dreams to be painted on, that it would be built, that someone would live there, me, <laughs> and would wake up and paint the dreams on the walls as another way of fusing with the all. Oh, I should say, I, I um, worked for a printer a little bit. I, I printed these in a print shop and kind of worked for the printer in Rome. Made up 10 of them, because I didn't really know what to do with them. And I ended up uh, stuffing the shelves of Palazzo de Esposizione, the bookstore there. They had postcards. And I, without them knowing, I would just put my postcards in their shelves. And I used to eat lunch there and write letters, and I would check this, this, you know, this, the inventory, and I would supply them with ones that sold. And after the, the year was over, I, I went back and I said, hi, I'm the one. And apparently, I, I caused a big problem, because Italy at the time was really being very careful about taxes and tangipoli, and they had all this inventory, not that much, but that they sold of mine, but they couldn't account for. But anyway, <laughs> some of my students, including John Sara, took some of these, and, and it was really beautiful. They, if they went across the world. They ended up in postcard racks, like in uh, Athens. I think one of my students came across some that you placed there. So they really were, there was, again, there was no intention of showing these, but they just sort of got cast like a seed pod, which I often wonder, wouldn't it be interesting to take a film of a, a meadow of wildflowers, and then to wind that time lapse film back to the, you know, a seed pod, you know, where those seeds came from. And I did that once with fireworks, actually. I, I went to uh, Shea Stadium on 4th of July, and I stayed in the parking lot and filmed the fireworks and then played it backwards. It's really spectacular to see these random points of light <laughs> with intention go to that point, which in some ways I think is the creative process, too. In the book that is being published by MIT Press, I use this metaphor of the storm throughout as this metaphor for what we do in the creative process. So there's my father, the architect. There's me standing in the house that my father designed on the left. You, you see me. He put me in all the photos for scale. <laughs> <laughs> 
And you can see that this on the right is another photo of that same space, because on the left you can see this little rectangle that was taped on the window to prevent me and my sisters from running through the glass, um, which you can see here on the right, but this is a photo taken at night with my mother's reflection. So I thought, when I came across these slides, I realized that my father was interested probably in the same things for him to, to do this, to show the glass house during the day when it, when it extends outward, and then at night when it retracts to its reflection pulls back. So now, if you don't mind, I want to read a story. It's now looking at what you just saw, but looking backwards. Is this okay? Can I, can I do this? Read the story? Okay. It's called Sister Squared. Two sisters lived together in a glass house by the woods. They were identical twins and wore matching clothes ever since they were little girls. In order to tell them apart, one sister wore the letter S on the right shoulder of her outfits, and the other wore the number two on the left shoulder of hers. This was easily done because the same character could be traced, cut from fabric, and flipped, depending on to which sister's outfit it would be sewn. The letter S stood for sister, the firstborn of the twins, and the number two stood for squared, the secondborn twin. Squared always signed her name with a superscript too, being very particular about how she looked, Squared thought the two on her outfits were sewn too low. Although they looked the same, the two sisters had very different personalities. Sister was shy and introverted, and Square was quite the extrovert. Squared liked to be seen, stay up, and out late at night. Sister preferred the mornings when she could, would take walks in the woods surrounding their house on three sides. The other side faced a field where Sister never went. She always left the house into the woods where the trees were dense. She liked the solitude of walking in the woods' shadowed space. Squared, on the other hand, slept for most of the day. Sister didn't see her twin until the smells of dinner filled the house. Conversations at dinner were usually about sister's walks, where she went, and the trees she passed. Squared would excitedly talk about her night out and how she felt alive and in the world when dancing. Squared consulted her sister Square consulted sister on what to wear. At dusk, they would meet where the two hinged glass doors met in a corner of the house. With the lights on inside the house, the glass was reflective. And when the glass doors were open wide, the sisters could see all sides of their outfits through the reflection of one glass in the other. Sister and Squared would stand side by side and see their reflections in a stack curving into infinity, the monograms on their shoulders smaller and smaller until they were illegible. Like a two-way mirror, the glass walls were transparent or reflective, depending on the amount of light on each side. During the day, the dwelling's boundaries blew out from the planes of glass to reach in between the trees. At night, the twins could not see out, but one could easily be seen inside, from the, from inside the house from the outside without seeing who was doing the seeing. Sister imagined someone outside at night looking in. It made her afraid of the dark. It was as if the house had two personas, relaxed, expanding into the surrounding woods during the day, and contracted, self-reflecting dwelling at night. One night, sister stayed up, squared stayed home, and the twins played cards. Because sister didn't want to be visible from the outside, they played by candlelight. Out of nowhere, a moth flew towards the light. Sister hated moths. Afraid of the dark, moths ate the leaves that formed the shadowed space of the woods that sister loved. Sister cast a spell. She said, in girum imus nocte et consumamor igni. The moth flew towards the light again, but this time flew too close and into the candle, getting caught in the molten wax. The moth tried to pull itself out, but could not escape. Whoops, how do I get back? OK, sorry. The moth flew towards the light again, but this time flew too close and into the candle getting caught in the molten wax. The moth tried to pull itself out, but could not escape the hardening wax, and was cast at the candle's edge in its struggling gesture. Days were easier for sister as she took to the woods. She wove a path through the natural placement of trees. Between two trees, two more trees, and between those two trees, two more. Each tree had cast a visual shade, a sweep of obscured space. And when her line of sight shifted just by a fraction of an inch, a completely different set of views extended into its depth. 
Sister's moving point of view exchanged one visual shade for another, a blinking shadowed space. Sister imagined a seedling's destiny tied to how much light was left after the surrounding trees already took the air and light that they could. Lightning struck some down, giving room for saplings. Others died of rot or ice storm. Gypsy moths made banquets of oak trees. Bats slept in their hollowed trunks. The woods were her dance hall. She felt in the world here, dancing with the phenomena of you and shade. The next evening at dinner, Squared was excitedly talking about her plans for the night out dancing when she noticed Sister's fallen face. What's wrong, Squared asked. I wish I wasn't so shy. Sister replied, maybe if I didn't feel so exposed, I would go out like you. I feel safe in the woods with all its shadows. I wish I could live in a house that's shadowed like the woods, Sister answered. Then do it. Design a house that's shadowed like the woods and we'll build it. Sister's face began to glow and expand into a smile. The sisters made a pact that evening to build a house of visual shadows. The next day, Sister brought her sketchbook and pencils with her on her walk in the woods. She drew what she imagined was there, all the eyes of the chipmunks, raccoons, rabbits, birds, and even possible intruders. She drew cones from those imagined eyes coming from all directions. The drawing looked like a seed pod of intersecting spikes. Trees stood intercepting the cones of sight. That gave Sister an idea. Her house should be designed to intercept sight cones. Sister went home and made cones from paper and tape, tall, narrow cones, wide, short cones, and oblique cones. At dinner, Sister showed Squared the cones and told her about her idea. If we intercept all these cones, we'll have the design of the house, she said. Squared looked puzzled. I have an idea, but we need to light the candle, Sister said. They cleared the table and arranged the cones. Sister cast her spell again, but this time in reverse. In Girem, Imus nocte et consumamor igni. Sister lit the candle with the encased moth. Pre preoccupied with her experiment, she didn't notice as the wax melted from its wings. Sister had a card in it that had a hole in it. By holding the card in front of the candlelight, a cone of light cast through its hole. Where this cone of light fell on a paper cone was an intersection of two cones. Sister held the card close to the candle to make the cone of light wide and far from the candle to make the cone of light narrow. Angling the card, the cast cone was oblique. Sister placed the card. The intersection of the light and the paper cone was petal-shaped. Squared traced the petal-shaped intersection on each of the paper cones. Templates would be cut from the tracings and the walls of the house built. As the twins moved around the table, the petal-shaped walls appeared. What was that? asked Sister. What was what? asked Squared. That, Sister said, as a shadow flew past the cones. Was it a bat I saw? The black shadow in the air flew in sync with its shadow on the walls and ceiling, a crack through the room. Sister got up and opened a door so that it could fly away. Once all the walls were cut and tr were traced and cut, S Sister blew out the candle. The moth was gone. Sister said nothing about it, and the twins went to bed. <coughs> Sister had a dream that night of a flower blooming. She was inside the flower where the seed pod was, while the flower slowly opened up around her. From the inside, she heard the words, never, not for a single day, do we have before us that pure space the flowers continually open into. For us, it's always a world, and never a nowhere without the no, a pure, unguarded space you can breathe and fully realize and not be longing after. Out of nowhere, a giant moth approached its wings flapped like flags, sending puffs of pollen into the air. Sister awoke coughing, but longing after the flower's space. She took out her sketchbook to draw the light-filled and magically open nowhere without the no, and wondered, if, life, if light shapes flowers, then it could shape my house too. Sister set out to shape all the parts of the house from projected light. For weeks, Sister worked on the model of the shadow house, light projected on cones shaped petal walls, the shadows of petal walls cast on other cones made a second set of walls. The space in between became rooms and the projected lines overhead vaults. All of the petal walls could be arranged to project the center of the house so that it could be obscured from sight, a blind spot. And if all the space of the house were arranged around the blind spot, sister could move from one space to another without being visible from the outside. 
Sister laid out a plan, a folded geometry of spaces organized around a blind spot. The, the fold of the plan ran north-south with the spaces built up around, each space a couple of steps higher than the previous, so that when all the spaces were in place, the center of the house was a spiraling stair. She wrote the letters DN for down on the steps. That night, Sister had a dream that she was in a blind spot. Again, like her dream of being inside of a flower, everything was in slow motion. As the lights slowly lent, entered the blind spot, she could see a giant lens that slowly focused the light. An upside down image started to take form on a concave wall on the other side of the lens. Just as the image started to appear, she realized that she was inside of an eye and she thought, is it I? It is I, and woke up. Sister took out her dream journal and sketched the, her dream of an eye and thought, images are possible only in blind spots. I have to build a lens for my house. The twins discussed the plans for, din for the house over dinner. Squared thought that she and her friends could start building it at night with lamps at full scale. Sister had an idea to make a lens to project images from the outside into the house's blind spot. The sisters agreed, and Squared set out to recruit her friends, and sisters set out to make a lens. Sister shaped the lens from the base of a giant glass jug as Squared and her friends built the house. The lens took shape as the house took form. Once the lens was perfectly curved, Sister started to polish it using finer and finer grit. The lens became sharper and clearer as the house grew more shadowed. Squared told Sister that bats would visit the building site. She could see them in the lamplight, diving and catching moths, casting shadows on the petal-shaped walls. One day, Sister held up the lens and it focused a sharp beam of sunlight. It's done. She went back to the plan of the house to draw the lens in place and the blind spot on the house. But this time, she viewed the drawing from another point of view. DN, which she had written earlier for down, appeared as up. Hmm, she thought, a downside upstair, a perfect place for a lens that projects images upside down. Sister felt satisfied and went to bed. The next morning, Sister awoke to find her lens missing and the glass house empty. Nothing, not even squared, was there. Sister went outside and ventured down to the open field where the shadow house was being built. It was the first time that she went into the open and the first time she saw the house, a strange set of petal-shaped walls and vaults. It was surprisingly porous. None of the walls enclosed a room, yet she could not see deep into its center. The walls of the house were arranged exactly like the model, screening its core, making it invisible. Sister wove her way past the petal-shaped walls and into the house. At the core of the house, a stair accumulated from the levels of each room and connected all the spaces of the house. There was her lens, mounted in a wall, screening the stair. It projected a flashing image of the upside it, it projected a flashing image of the outside upside down on the concave surface of its twin wall. Sister had fantastic dreams and painted them on the concave surfaces of the walls of her house. The dreams projected, the, dreams, the dream images dissolved the appearance of the edges. The concave surface of the vaults she painted a deep blue because it made the vaults seem so far away that they almost disappeared. The walls filled with images of her dreams and the retina wall flashed with images from the outside projected by the lens. This was her practice for dwelling in a nowhere without the know, a pure, unguarded space you can breathe and fully realize and not be longing after. At dawn, Sister took to the woods to dance in its shadowed space, passing the glass house on her way. She imagined Square sleeping inside. At dusk, Square threw parties and danced with the reflections of the glass house. All the other Crepuscular animals, birds, and insects of the woods danced along in the twilight. Thank you. <laughs>